Good evening, guys. I'm going to start off tonight by answering a question that came in yesterday or the day before. Um, I think the question is, is a perfect uh, place for me to actually go into tonight's uh, topic and message. So I'm going to answer. It's out of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. The, the word says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Sorry, I forgot to... That should be better. So the question is, good evening guys, I see Andrew, hey brother, Miguel, Adam, God bless you guys. So the question that he asked me was, what does this mean? God commanded the light to shine out of darkness and has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Well, that word face of Jesus Christ, the face represents the person. Uh, in 1 Peter, uh, God said that, or Peter said of God that the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So what does that mean, the face of the Lord is against? It means the person. God himself is against those that do evil. So when the Bible here in 2 Corinthians 4 says that the, the light of the knowledge of, of, of the glory of God is revealed in the face of Jesus, it's, it's saying in the person of Jesus Christ. So in the person of Jesus Christ, you see the manifestation of who God is. And that's why Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And uh, I and my Father are one. And so Jesus is a manifestation of who God is in the flesh. If you want to know what God was like, you just look at the person of Jesus Christ, and then you can tell what God is like. So that will set up tonight's message. Hey, Diane, Papa Joe, God bless you, Mark. I see you guys. Love you guys. So tonight's message, I, I mean, it is so important. I, I, I can't, I, I might say this a lot. This is the most important thing I've ever said. I probably say that a lot or something along those lines. But I honestly believe it when I say it. And it seems like this that God has been teaching me in the last week has got to be the most impactful teaching that I've, actually, I've received from God in a very long time, if not ever. And I think this is a, a subject that has not been given the proper attention. I'm going to give you a word and let this word sink in. And I hope it, this word comes back to you day after day after day from this day forward. The word is called substitution. Substitution. Hey, Luann, God bless you. Substitution. Just think of this, this context. The word substitution means one who takes the place of another or a substitute is one who takes the place of another. Christianity is more about substitution maybe than anything. That Jesus took our place, and that doesn't stop there. See, that's only one half of substitution. And I think maybe we've considered that part more than the second part. James, God bless you. The second part of substitution is that you took Jesus' place. And that is more amazing and more radical than any concept that I can think of in the New Testament. Now, I think many of us have considered the, the first half of the word substitution that Jesus Christ took our place. Carlos Christa, God bless you. But we haven't considered, at least not fully, that we, the born-again, spirit-filled church of God in Jesus Christ, are actually the, the representatives of Christ on earth and that when they see us, we should be able to say, as Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because as Jesus was a pure manifestation of what God was, who God was, and he manifested God. Think about this. Jesus said, I, it's not me that doeth the works, but it's the Father in me. He doeth the works. So we should be able to say, as Jesus said, the works that you see coming out of our life. It's not me doing the works, but it's Christ within me. He doeth the works. In the same way that Jesus was the substitution or the manifestation in God's place on earth. Julie, Tracy, God bless you guys. We too must be, are called to be, the substitution, the picture. Marty and Art, God bless you. The picture of God, of Jesus Christ, to the people. Now, think about the magnitude. Chris, God bless you, brother. Think about the magnitude of this. 
Substitution is the subject for tonight. We're talking about substitution, one who takes the place of another. It's, it's evidently clear that Jesus Christ took our place on the cross, but it's not half as clear that we took his place on earth, meaning Jesus isn't on the earth doing the ministry. The only way the people will receive the ministry that, that Jesus Christ performs is through his body, his church. And we've got to see ourselves in that light as these substitutes so that, Johnny, God bless you, so that if we don't stand in our office as representatives of Jesus Christ, the world will not see Christ as they ought to, so that we stand, we, we in our right place are the image of Christ. That's why it says we are whom he foreknew he predestined that we would be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ, so that when they see us, they see Christ. Now, that means a whole lot more than just being nice to people. It means a whole lot more than just going to church. It means a whole lot more than even being able to recite some scripture. We stand in the authority in the power, in the name of Jesus Christ. And we need to see it that way. Now, let me, let me cover this from the beginning. We, we need to get back to this idea of substitution and really get the full impulse of what it meant for Christ to take our place. Because in realizing, recognizing, and then having faith in that reality that Christ took my place, we then can see the full purpose that he has for us by him taking our place so that we can take his place, so that we're, we had an exchange of natures. Jesus took upon me, on himself my sinful nature so that we could walk in his divine nature. Second Peter tells us that he's called us to be partakers of the divine nature. The divine nature, that's God's very nature, working in us and then through us. And that's the, the call of God. So, I want to give you this, this, this chapter and verse. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. Now, I think you've heard it, but maybe not considered it in this light. Paul said to the church at Corinth, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, I determined means I made up my mind that I was not going to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Well, what's implied? Because I've I've wondered at this verse before in my past, and I thought, you know, isn't that peculiar that he's, all, he's more identifying with the cross than he is the resurrection? Because you would think that Paul would have uh, said, I've determined not to know anything among you except Christ and him resurrected, because in the resurrection is the victory. It's, it's where uh, Jesus defeated death and hell. But here, Paul says, I determined not to know anything among you except Christ and him crucified. What was it about the crucifixion of Christ that Paul chose to identify with when he was before the people? Uh, this sent me on a pursuit, and I'm going to tell you what, it rocked me when I began to get the revelation of what Paul's saying. See, to Paul, the, the crucifixion of Christ was also the crucifixion of him. What do I mean by that? Jesus didn't just die for us, Jesus died with us. We died with Christ, and Paul got that. He taught that regularly in, in Romans 6 and other places. But I'm going to turn your attention to Galatians. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, a, a verse we probably know again, he said, I am crucified with Christ, Paul said. I am crucified with Christ. See, substitution. He identifies with Christ in the crucifixion. Brianna, Terrence, God bless you guys. So in the crucifixion, Paul identified with Christ on a level that he, he actually climbed up onto the cross with Paul and he saw himself taking the nails. He saw himself taking that beating and he saw himself killed. So then he goes on to say, I am crucified with Christ, yet nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, in my body, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Now think about that. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. He identified with Christ in crucifixion. He climbed up on the cross and he himself was killed. And when he died, he said, it's no longer I living, but it's Christ living in me. See, he identifies with the substitute. And so not only did Christ take Paul's place on the cross, but then Christ took Paul's place on the earth. So the life now that Paul was living was not out of his human same mind, same will, same intention. 
The life that he was now living was out of the faith of the Son of God. And that's not faith in the Son of God, which is different. This is the faith of the Son of God. You know, some people say, well, I don't have the faith to heal the sick. I don't have the faith to raise the dead. I don't have the faith, and I don't know if you ever will in your flesh. But something happens when we get the impulse, the impact of the substitutionary work of Christ on the cross, that he died in our place so that he could live in our place. And when we live out of the life of Christ, it's actually the faith of Christ that comes to live inside of us. So that now the the faith that we're operating is not just our own human faith contrived in our intellect. It's actually the faith of the resurrected Jesus who came to live in us. And what releases that faith to work in our lives is the reality of us living out of the substitutionary work of the cross. So Paul determined, to to, to Paul it wasn't something he went to the cross, had a one-time experience, and then went on. To Paul, the mode of his being was that of the cross, that I am crucified with Christ, yet nevertheless I live, but not I. That It's Christ now living in me, and the life I'm now living, I'm living by the faith of the Son of God. Joe, God bless you, Kevin. God bless you, sir. So that the life you now live. Now, he goes on to say in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, he said, I will glory in nothing else but the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom? By the cross. He said, I am crucified unto the world and the world is crucified unto me. What does that mean? Well, the world was no more to Paul. There was no more more attraction. There was no more, what does Paul want? What what direction is Paul going? You know, you hear preachers today say, follow your dreams. Don't follow your dreams. Cut your dreams off and say, I have no more dreams that are outside of what Christ wants to do through me. We're not chasing our dreams. We're We're chasing the will of God. And see, to Paul, he recognized that since Christ died in his place, he too is dead. It again says this in 2 Corinthians 5. It says, And that he died for all, Christ died for all, so that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him that died for them and rose again. So those who get the full impact of the revelation that Christ was our substitute. And so that when we come to the substitute, not only did he take our place in punishment, but he takes our place here on earth. So now when we think about the call of God on our lives to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to preach the gospel with power, to speak in tongues, you know, the very things that Jesus said are the signs that follow every true believer in Mark 16. When we think of those things, healing the sick and casting out demons in our own power, we think, who is sufficient for that? Who can do that? How could we ever do that? There's only but one way. It's to live out of the revelation of the substitutionary work of Christ and that he took your punishment. He took your judgment. He took the pain and the anguish of soul. He took your sickness. He took your sin and he bore it. He took the curse of the law. The Bible says Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. He substituted for us and took our punishment, took the curse, took the pain, so that he could also possess our lives. So when we come to Christ, we have to see it as more than just coming to acknowledge some theory or doctrine or theology and even adhere to some statement of faith or some dogmas. When we're coming to Christ, it's not to take on a new way of thinking. It's to take on a complete and total new identity. It's to actually climb up on the cross as Paul did, put our hands and feet out and be nailed to that tree along with our master, Jesus Christ, so that he can have full ownership of your vessel so that he then can live through your life. If it's not that kind of surrender, it's not Bible surrender. Surrender is not just you stopping sinning. That's not all surrender entails, although it obviously entails that. Surrender is you yielding on the cross with Christ to take his place because he took your place. So it's not enough to just say Christ died for my sins. That's great. He did die for your sins. But like 2 Corinthians 5 says, because he died for you, you should no longer live for yourself, but unto him that died for them and rose again. So now Christ possesses you. He doesn't just die for you so that you can go to heaven. He dies in your place to absorb the punishment of sin upon himself to give you to give you access to the Father so that you can come and be accepted in him so that now you can experience the same power that Jesus experienced from the Father. And that's the prayer of Jesus in John 17. Father, 
He prayed, Jesus, Father, that they may be one in us as you are in me and I am in you, that they too should be one in us. Jesus didn't call us to some lesser life than that which he possessed on earth. He called us to the very same power. John 14, 12, the works that I did, you shall do also, and greater works than these shall you do because I go to the Father. The, the, this is mind-boggling when you think of this word, substitution, that God didn't just accept us as sinners and then just, you know, say, okay, I'll let you in heaven and then, and then just kind of let us linger on in life until we die. We have this idea of Christianity that does a whole lot for us after we die, but doesn't do much for us here. And see, God didn't call us to that kind of redemption. The redemption of Christ is an earthly redemption as well as a heavenly redemption. He came to give us the abundant life now. He came to live through us now. He's not just interested in your body when it's dead. The Bible says that the Lord is for the body and the body is for the Lord. Your body is what God wants. He wants possession of your hands, your eyes, your feet, and every aspect of you so that he can manifest Jesus through you to the world. And the thing that hinders his ability to flow through our physical body is our unwillingness to climb up on that cross with him and identify with him in death, to yield our will to such a degree that we say from this day forward, Lord Jesus Christ, you have possession of this vessel. My eyes are your eyes. My hands are your hands. My mouth, that's your mouth. My time, that's your time. My money, that's your money. My will, that's your will. I live only, and I mean only, to do the will of God. Until we come to that place of surrender, we will not be able to be the conduits through which Christ can flow freely like Paul said. I still live, Paul said. I still live, yet not I. But the life that I'm now living, I live by the faith of the Son of God. That is to say the Son of God has perfect freedom and he, owns, he has full possession of my being because I'm dead with him. So my every activity is his activity. My preaching, that's his preaching. My praying, that's his praying. My working, that's his working. I'm not out doing it for Christ. It's Christ in me. He doeth the works, Paul said. Jesus said, it's God in me doing the work. It's not I. So you're still actively doing it, but it's through this place of surrender and submission. It goes beyond keeping rules. It goes to the idea that every activity of mine is the activity of Christ. This gives new light. Let me give you two scriptures that you need to study in light of what I'm teaching, the substitutionary work of Christ. The first one is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Matter of fact, we can read them together. I'll try to slow down. Some people tell me I talk too fast. The good thing about Facebook is you can pause and rewind and go back and listen to these later and get the whatever you might have missed. But if I try to slow down, sometimes it, it affects me because I have to keep going. So listen, though, carefully to 1 Corinthians 6. In light of this idea of substitution, Christ our substitute. Verse 19. What, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Do you not know that your body? He didn't say your spirit. Now obviously the spirit of God regenerates us in our spirit. But it's not just the spirit God's after. It's your physical body. Listen, Christ can't manifest through us unless he has possession of our body. So, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have, have of God? And listen, you are not your own. You don't own yourself. You don't own rights to yourself. Now, to some people, that sounds like a form of bondage, like you're losing rights to make your own choices. But if you understand the substitutionary work of Christ and really what he wants to accomplish through our lives, the idea of Christ owning my body is the most amazing, fantastic, spectacular idea I could have ever come up with. Because when Jesus has possession of my body, he can manifest himself to a dying world who's going to hell and losing their identity and turning to sin in kinds of ways that we haven't even heard of before. 10-year-olds and 11-year-olds in the world all around us is being seduced and corrupted and perverted in ways you can't even believe. And what they're dying to see is not somebody who says, hey, do you want to go to church on Sunday, as great as that is. What they're dying to see is people who have Jesus Christ in them and has free pass to, to be flowing through them and releasing his power to them. Boy, I want to preach a message, and I, I was even going to do this tonight, but I knew this had to come first. I want to preach a message about being a minister of the Spirit. 
Did you know that's your call in the New Testament? And probably I'll teach that in a few days. I'll just give you a little introduction to this concept that God brought me into last week. Do you, do you know that your job, if you're a minister of God, is not to just call yourself a preacher? You know, I, I always identified myself as a preacher, a preacher of righteousness, in fact, is what I would call myself. And the Lord, the Lord opened my eyes to see, but that's not what the New Testament is looking, looking for. The New Te we need to preach. Don't, don't get me wrong. We better preach. That's our, that's our job is to go preach, but that's not our identity. We're called ministers of the Spirit. He said, the Paul said this in Galatians 3, he that ministereth the Spirit to you. Does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Obviously by the hearing of faith. But listen what it says. He that ministereth the Spirit to you. Beckett, God bless you, brother. He that ministereth the Spirit unto you. Does he do that by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? See, our job isn't just to preach. See, sometimes we think our job is just to tell people like it is and preach. Get the word out there. Well, you know, if that's all your objective is, you might preach and preach and preach, and I've preached thousands of sermons, and I'm going to continue to preach thousands more, Lord willing. But that's not the ultimate objective. The ultimate objective is to minister the Spirit to people. So that goes beyond just preaching. Preaching is good, but the Bible says the kingdom of heaven is not in word, but in power. It's in the demonstration of the Spirit. Now, the Bible says this of the new covenant, that he's made us ministers of the New Testament, which is not of the letter, but of the Spirit, because the letter kills and the Spirit gives life. So we're called ministers of the new covenant, which is ministry in the Spirit. So our job is to take the Spirit that's in here and let him come through our hands, through our eyes, through our words, to touch and heal and deliver and set free people who are in untold bondage. But see, that flow of the Spirit can't come through me when there's blocks in me, when I haven't let the Lord have me, when I'm hindering the Lord through doubt, negativity, unbelief, sin, carnality, ignorance, whatever there's a block in my inward man from the Spirit of God coming through me, then I can't minister the Spirit. So all I'm stuck doing is telling people what they need to change and what they need to do and what they ought not to do. And we need to preach and we need to correct and we need to rebuke and we need to exhort. But let's not just see ourselves as preachers. That's cheap and easy. Let's see ourselves as ministers of the new covenant. Everywhere Jesus went, he ministered. Sometimes in preaching, sometimes in teaching, sometimes in sitting next to a woman and saying you have, you've had five husbands and the one you have now isn't your own husband. Sometimes it was, I don't condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Sometimes it was in the name of Jesus. <laughs> well, he didn't say that of himself, but his disciples said, in the name of Jesus. I don't have silver, I don't have gold, but what I do have in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. There was all this outflow of ministry happening through Jesus and all of his disciples who had the Holy Spirit. They saw themselves as ministers. They met the need. What was the need? See, we have this one size fit all, just preach the sermon and hope it works and some will get it and some won't. And if they don't, at least I sowed the seed. Well, that's true. But look, let's look at ourselves in a different light. We are ministers of the new covenant, ministers of the spirit. Listen what Paul said. It's as though Christ did beseech you through us so that we stand in Christ's stead saying, be ye reconciled unto God. Listen what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5. I'm standing in Christ's stead. You know what that means? I'm standing instead of Christ. You worship leaders, you preachers, you teachers, you evangelists, you all ministers of God. Let's not see ourselves as singers and players and preachers and teachers. Let's see ourselves as ministers of the Spirit. If you're an intercessor, if you're a mom, if you're a dad, if you're a husband, a wife, a whoever, you are a minister of the new covenant, which is a ministry in the Spirit. You're, you're called to be a conduit. Isn't this what Jesus taught in John chapter 7? He said, he that believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his belly, he that believes on me, as the scripture says, not in their own way, but they believe on me according to the right tr truth in the scripture, out of your belly or out of your innermost being will flow rivers, flow, listen to this, flow rivers of living water. Oh man. Jesus said, I'm that water. You drink this water, you'll never thirst again. Well, that water is supposed to ush, gush and usher out of us on the people of, of, of the, that are hearing our voice so that through us comes life in the spirit. 
And then Jesus said in, in John 7, This spoke he of the Holy Ghost that they which believe should receive, for as of yet the Holy Ghost had fallen on none of them because Jesus was not yet glorified. But get the picture, get the image that Jesus died in our place. He substituted. In other words, he took the punishment that was due us so that he could absorb our penalty. We need to spend some time, I think, contemplating that and the magnitude of what punishment was due us and that Christ came down and said, Father, I will take their punishment in its full. And so the whippings, the beatings, the punchings, the strippings, the stripings, the, the thorns in the scalp and the ridicule and the laughing and the nakedness and the humiliation, that was ours. That was supposed to come upon us, not once on the cross, but for eternity, day after day and century after century. We were to receive the punishment due us and Christ suffered once for sins so that we could be, be absolved from the penalty. He took my place and he didn't take my place and then put me on probation. He took my place and instantly called me a son when I repent of my sins. Now, we must repent of sins and we must believe the gospel and we must approach him in faith and repentance. And when we do, we don't get on probation. He instantly gives us the benefit of that sacrifice or that substitution so that he took our unrighteousness, our sicknesses and our sins, and in exchange, he hands us his righteousness. God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The church that's conscious of this reality, of this revelation, and lives from the power of that revelation by faith and steps as though they believe it and walks and lives as though they believe it is the church filled with the power of God to help people in their needs, not just to point the finger and tell them what they need to change, but to release the spirit of the living God through their physical body because Jesus Christ has found a home with no restrictions and no blocks and he can minister right through them to the world. Jesus Christ has been shut up in heaven next to the right hand of God because his church hasn't understood that they have been delivered. They have been sanctified. They have been saved. They have been forgiven. They have been redeemed. They have received all things pertaining to life and godliness. They are seated with him in heavenly places. They have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And they are believers and they are the called of God and they have access to all of Christ's power and the works he did they should be out doing. But instead, we're sitting in church wondering where the power of God is, waiting on it to fall out of the sky. Instead of climbing up into the position that God has blessed us in, that we are sons redeemed, we can cry out, Abba, Father, and we've received the down payment, which is the inheritance, the, the, the down payment of, is the earnestness of the Spirit within us, proving to us what we have coming, we can't even think ask or imagine what God has in store. But we have the down payment of that now that we're supposed to be giving away to the sinners of this world. But that requires a kind of surrender and death and an, and an identity with Christ in the cross that something happened when I climbed up on the cross. There was an exchange. I gave my old sin nature and I got his nature. I gave my dark life and he, and he gave me the light. I gave him all my rebellion and he gave me all his sonship. Jesus didn't put us on probation. Do you know, 50 days after Peter denied Christ, he became the spokesman for the church. God is willing to forgive us of our sins and cleanse our unrighteousness even as we've been following him and making mistakes. If we'll just stop, call a halt to our life and confess our sins and climb up on the cross with Christ, in that idea of substitution, Christ will take our sins and our unrighteousness and he'll fill us with his Holy Spirit. Peter was a denier and 50 days later, he was the spokesman of the Holy Ghost. God is so willing to pour out his spirit in this generation if we would get the idea that Christ died in our place so that he could live in our place. And if we would but yield and get out of the way, throw all of our dreams, our aspirations, our desires, our motivations, our ambitions, throw them all down at the feet of King Jesus and let him come in and possess this vessel so that he can use our hands, get all the darkness out of our life, get the crooked path straight so that we can see the salvation of God. The earth is dying for lack of seeing those substitutes of Christ who stand in his stead and beseech the world to be reconciled unto God. We plead with sinners, be reconciled unto God. And we don't just tell them where they're wrong. We show them what's right. This is what you can have, a life filled with God. God hasn't called us to just change ourselves. God's called us to climb up on the cross with Christ. 
and to take his place in death so that he can take our place in life. So we can say as Paul, I'm dead. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. If God had his way every day, we would be able to say, we live in Christ's stead, and Christ lives in my stead. So when you've seen me, you've seen Christ. I and my Father are one. Amen. Let's, pr let's pray. Let's pray together right now. I'm going to pray over you. I do want to give you a few more scriptures to study. I think we should all read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 21, where it talks about the new creature, and it talks about the ministry of reconciliation, and it talks about Paul taking the place of Christ and beseeching the world to be reconciled. We've got to get the idea of what the new creature is. Old things, it says, are passed away, and all things, all things, not a few things, not some things, Adam, God bless you, not some things, all things become new. Let's, let's get rid of that old thinking, that old wineskin, that old religious men mentality. Let's get into the Spirit and walk with Him. There's other scriptures. I'll cover them later. Let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray for those, Lord, that you, you connected me with, those that are listening and will listen to this video. My God, I pray that we would get the full impulse, the impact of this word, substitution, that you took our place on the cross. You